everyone, I'm Jim Longworth and welcome to a special voter education edition of Triad Today, where over the next half hour you'll hear from the two major party candidates for United States Senate, Sherry Beasley and Ted Budd. But before we do that, here are a few words from uh, Todd Hall, the president and CEO of True Light Federal Credit Union, who is helping to sponsor this program. At True Light Federal Credit Union, we understand the importance of the ballot box in shaping our future. Institutions led by state and local leaders form the foundation of our society. Giving candidates for office a platform to engage voters on the issues that matter the most in our communities is essential to the health of our democracy. We support Triad Today's commitment to voter education because of its importance in the political process. I'm Todd Hall, President and CEO of Truliant, and we hope you enjoy this special presentation. Thanks, Todd. When we come back, we'll hear from Sherry B. Back now on this special voter education edition of Triad Today, and our special guest is someone who's been here before, and we're so glad she's back. Sherry Beasley is a former Chief Justice of the North Carolina State Supreme Court, and she is the Democratic candidate for United States Senate. Welcome back. Thank you, Jim. Let's get as much in as we can, because I know people want to hear you talk about different issues, and then we'll give you a website at the end. They can go in depth on that. Inflation, let's talk about that. There's nearly 40 million people living in poverty, 12 million children going hungry every day. Inflation's hurting families trying to make ends meet. What are your solutions to try to bring down that rate of inflation? You know, it's true that I'm traveling all over our beautiful state, 100 counties, and uh, the prevailing issue really is rising costs. People are feeling everything from pain at the pump to the cost of prescription drugs and everything else in between. And I know we're trying to get through uh, the impact of the supply chain issues. I also know it's really important that there are corporations that are price gouging at a time when they are making record profits. And that's really just not right for North Carolinians. No. And if I you also, get elected, you want to go after them, right? Well, yes. I mean, I, there, there should be a penalty for them, yeah. for sure. And I think it's also really important, important for us to really focus on our made in America economy so that we're making more of our goods here in the state. Absolutely. Now, let's, you mentioned health care, so let's go to that. Uh, Bernie Sanders, one thing I really loved about Bernie Sanders, years and years and years ago, he was pushing for Medicare for all. What do you think about that? You know, folks are certainly, they have high health care costs. And I can tell you from my own family, we have twin sons who have had lots of surgeries and, and health care treatments. And so it's a really big deal for lots of families in the state. You know, I know that this, that the Congress passed this legislation, bipartisan legislation, to allow Medicare to negotiate drug prices down for seniors, cap insulin for seniors, but we need more. I mean, it costs are just too high for so many folks. And it really is important that we be able to negotiate with drug prices prices, drug companies to keep their prices down. My opponent, Congressman Ted Budd, voted against lowering drug prices. And I mean, folks are really feeling the impact of the costs of drug prices here in this country. We just have to do more. And the next senator has to commit to doing that. Um, uh, speaking of uh, health care issues, uh, folks can use medical marijuana, in a, as I said, in a medical sense. But what about recreational use of marijuana? Are you for making uh, that legal? You know, the former Chief Justice of the Supreme Court uh, does think we should legalize cannabis. I think that there are a host of ways you mentioned uh, legal uh, m medical marijuana use. It's helpful for folks. But it also is a great way to uh, give our farmers a way to diversify their crops. It's a huge... It goes back to your Made in America thing. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Although who would have thought years ago when you were sitting on the court that you'd, you'd be saying, yeah, farmers can, can grow marijuana to help everybody. The world has changed, but we know that we've lost over the last two decades, 12,000 farmers right here in North Carolina. And it's a t agriculture is a top industry here in the state, and we've got to make sure that we're giving farmers the tools that they need. Absolutely. Let's, let's shift to safe schools for a minute. 27 more children, I just checked on it yesterday, 27 more children have been shot to death at school since January. Um, hundreds of various individual shootings, but 27 that we lost, 20 kids, 27 kids. What's your solution for making schools safer? from gun violence? You know, I, I, and I come from a family that hunts, and so that's so much a part of the culture here in North Carolina, that's who we are. As a former judge, I also know that we can and must protect the Second Amendment. I'm also a mom of twin sons, and I know that we must keep our schools safe. We've had this bipartisan legislation passed 
uh, on gun safety and mental health for our children, which was, by the way, uh, really acceptable to the law enforcement officers here in the state, and our two senators voted for it. Congressman Bud voted against it. But we really do need more. We need universal background checks. We need red flag laws. And there is absolutely no reason to have weapons of war on our streets. And guns should not be in the hands of people who can can't use them responsibly and who use them dangerously. You know, parents, in so many cases, and there was two of them recently, where uh, one was a four-year-old girl, somebody else that was close to that age, brought a gun to school, didn't really know what it was, had access to it through their parents. Their parents didn't know they brought it. Should the penalties be tougher on parents who allow guns to, to be so accessible? What I know is that hopes and, and thoughts and prayers are not enough. We've got to be tough on making sure that guns should not be in the hands of people who, who, who can't use them responsibly. And I know that the Senate really must lead um, in making legislation that protects all of our children across this what country. What about arming teachers? Some people say that's the solution. You know, most teachers don't want to be armed. I mean, they're not security. They're our teachers. Uh, we certainly need to value them, and they certainly need to be paid more. Yeah. Uh, but, but to put that responsibility on them while they have a wealth of responsibilities of teaching our children at a time when so many of our children have fallen behind during this pandemic, I think is unfair. Student loan forgiveness. President Biden's, uh, I just saw the, uh, the figures yesterday uh, from the government. They said it'll cost $400 billion over the next 10 years. Meanwhile, what a lot of people don't know is a lot of low income students who will get their loans forgiven will wake up one morning having to pay thousands of dollars in income taxes on that. So from both sides of this thing, it sounds like it's pretty expensive. Do you support that plan in general for student loan forgiveness? Or do you think we just need to buckle down and, and just say, look, if, if you need to honor your commitments and somehow pay off your loan, where do you stand? I think, Jim, you've raised some really great concerns. And, and while the student loan forgiveness will mean the difference for a lot of people, what we know is that about a third of the folks who have student loan debt never finished college because they couldn't afford it. And we also know that about 60% of the loans that are in default are, many of them are held by senior citizens. So I think we have to get to the crux of the issue, which is that education is just too costly, uh, that we've got to make sure that when people enter these loan arrangements that they're transparent and they really understand what they're signing. We need to lower the cost, the, the interest rate on folks who can uh, uh, re um, finance these loans, and then we also need to increase the number of Pell Grants and also offer options for people who, where college is not the path, that there are apprenticeship and, and vocational programs that are great right here in North Carolina, and I think we have to support those. A great community college system Absolutely. throughout the state uh, and, and in this area, GTCC, for example, and just doing a great job. They're fantastic. Let's talk about in immigration for a second. The influx, and I don't need to tell you this, the influx of illegal immigrants in the United States is straining the social safety nets of our city, especially the large cities, but in other areas too. If elected, would you support an increase, let's say, in deportations? You know, I think the beauty of this whole thing is that while we understand that we needed a whole overhaul on immigration, Democrats and Republicans agree on that. And we've got to take serious messages to make sure that we're reforming immigration, but also securing our borders. It's incredible. It's, 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 cure. it's important to do that. I think the other piece of this is while we have uh, folks who are asylum seekers, need visas, agriculture visas to help our farmers. Uh, we have got to make sure that this system is far more efficient and cost effective for folks. We can do that piece, reform immigration, while also securing our borders to make sure that the people who are trying to get in here and don't belong in this country are not in this country. Let's talk about social media. TikTok, as you know, is owned by a Chinese company. So a South Dakota congressman recently said he wants to ban TikTok apps on military installations because of potential security risk. Meanwhile, parents all over the country are concerned about the dangers of influence of social media platforms in general. You're a parent, and, and if elected, there's some things that I know you can do, and I'd like to see that. I want to ask, I don't want to in, inject my prejudice, but it seems to me, I'm a broadcaster, we're very closely regulated. Do you favor regulating social media that way? I know we certainly have to make some real considerations, and there are um, a lot, of, there's, clearly there's a lot of impact. Young people in particular stay on social media, and we do have to be thoughtful about the kinds of things that our young people are taking in. And I do think there have to be more, more regulations. We have to balance the importance and the protections 
offered by the First Amendment, which is constitutional, with making sure that we're keeping people safe. One of the things I hear, and I'm an unaffiliated uh, voter, I used to be Republican, I, I vote for both you know, party candidates and some independent candidates, so I'm sort of neutral on this. But let me just say to you, in all honesty, and you and I talked about this before when you were on the show, a lot of folks come up to me and say, those liberal Democrats mm -hmm. are just too politically correct. And one example is we have teachers and professors now having to go to court to save their jobs because they made the mistake of calling a student something other than Mr. or Miss. And, and, and this cancel culture thing, and what, is that really healthy? I mean, how do you stand on something like that? I think the bottom line is that when we have leaders in place who value who we all are, and there are people who are not gonna fit the mold of who we think they ought to be. Um, that, that we find ourselves in a place where we are valuing North Carolinians and we're valuing Americans. And I don't know that we need to legislate that piece. What I, the part I don't like is the legislation that targets specific groups of people like LGBTQI plus folks. I, I think it's wrong. I think it is, um, for those of us who are Christian, I think it is unchristian. And I think it's un-American. And I think we really have to be focused more so on all of the things that bring us together, the commonalities. And I agree with you, whether you're Democrat, Republican, or Independent, so many of these issues really are not partisan. This is about what works for North Carolina, what works for our country, and making sure that people here have what the, the tools that they need really to be successful in their lives. Uh, Judge, do you support term limits for congressmen, senators, and Supreme Court judges? You know, I, there's a reason that judges have lifetime appointments and, and there should offer um, a la a ability of freedom to make sound decisions based on the rule of law and the Constitution. Now, lifetime appointments don't mean that you have to stay a lifetime, right? And so I certainly appreciate people's concerns there, but I just know that we have to be thoughtful about um, how we legislate that piece, because the third branch of government really should have the freedom. I know we're concerned about a lot of the decisions that they're making uh, recently, but I think the way to handle that is not adjusting the term limits. I think that has more to do with who's in the Senate, because that's the one who looks at the nomination process as closely. I want to, before we run out of time, I want to give you a minute or so just to remind folks why you're running for the United States Senate. You know, I'm really thankful. I've been in public service for nearly 30 years as public defender and judge and chief justice of the Supreme Court. And I know that it's really important and very healthy to have a respect for the rule of law. And I have spent my entire years of service upholding the Constitution. I've worked with law enforcement officers to keep our community safe. And I know that that kind of experience is exactly what we need in the Senate. We need a, we need a senator who's going to put North Carolina first and not be all embroiled in the pettiness of partisan and politics, and politics in Washington. So I would urge folks to go to sherrybeasley.com for more information about my campaign. I'd certainly love to have them join us. You know, you took that right out of my mouth. I was going to put that up on screen. And you stole my thunder. I was going to put, <laughs> I was going to put the, well, let's put it up on screen now, www.sherrybeasley.com where you can learn about all the positions and things. I know we had to scoot through this because we wanted to cover as many issues, but you can take your time, read through the website, and look at all of those issues. Judge Beasley, I appreciate the uh, your service uh, to the state, and good luck on the campaign, and hope this isn't the last time we talk. Thank you, Jim. Appreciate it. All right. We'll be right back after this. Back now on this uh, special voter education edition of Try It Today. You've heard from Sherry Beasley early in the program, and now we turn our attention to the Republican candidate for the United States Senate. Ted Budd is a third-term congressman from the 13th District, and we welcome you back to Try It Today. Good to see you again. Thank you, Jim. Good to see you. Well, let's uh, get as much in as we can in the allotted time, and I know you're used to doing that with debates and everything. Let's try to rip through some of these, these important issues. And let's start with inflation, because that's really important to everybody. How big of a problem is inflation, and what caused it? It's a 40-year problem. We haven't had inflation this bad uh, since the Carter administration leaking, leaking into the, the Reagan administration. Uh, we know how to fix this, but the problem is the, the ideology of the left, the ideology of, of Sherry Beasley, the ideology of Joe Biden won't allow us to fix it. What do you mean to fix it? Uh, we got to have more energy. I mean, that's what's driving this. I mean, I'm talking with fertilizer producers, uh, you know, to produce our food, the diesel uh, producers that need to go in the trucks to get it to the grocery stores. Everything that the left wants to do makes it harder on those folks, which is driving up prices right now, encouraging people not to come back to work. I mean, that's what they did for a while, but that's what's a lot of what's causing the worker shortage right now. And now gas prices are about ready to go back up because of what the Saudi Arabian OPEC did. So, uh, and winter uh, heating fuel prices 
comes uh, just on the edge of winter here in just a few months. Let's shift to safe schools. Let's talk about our schools because uh, all parents, well, everybody should be concerned about this, yeah. but especially parent, you're a parent. 27, by my count, 27 children have been shot to death at school just since January. Um, what's your solution for making schools truly safe? Well, absolutely. This is heartbreaking. And as a parent, we all want our kids, our neighbors, our friends, our loved ones, we want them to come home safely. You have to keep firearms out of the hands of dangerous individuals. But you can do that, Jim, without infringing upon Second Amendment rights. We need to enforce the laws that are on the books, many of those that aren't being. We need to deal with mental illness, which is uh, an increasing problem. Because all these people, people do, these people do these shootings, are I'm sorry, they're crazy. They are. And there's, there's not enough being done revolving around mental illness. Uh, many of these people have had uh, escalating encounters with law enforcement over and over and over again. And we need to take it very seriously and make sure that we keep firearms out of their hands. What about, uh, you know, there's some people, just like when the air, we start having a lot of hijacks and things, people say, oh, let's have pilots have guns. Uh, do you think it's a good idea for teachers to be armed? Because there are a lot of people think that would be a solution. I think that need, needs to be to solved at, or solved at the state and the local level. I don't think that's something that you want to solve at a federal level. And since you mentioned keeping hands out of the gun, uh, uh, guns out of the hands of people who are uh, have mental problems or whatever, let's run with that for a second. Um, should there be stiffer penalties for parents? who make guns more accessible to students. I'm thinking of a couple weeks ago, there was a four-year-old, um, it might have been somewhere in North Carolina, who went to school just to show off her daddy's gun. She didn't know what she was doing. She was four years old, went to preschool. Should there be stiffer penalties for parents that even make guns like that more accessible in the home? So the ATF actually requires, and the North Carolina law requires that there's actually safe storage for those and keeps them out of the hands of minors and those that shouldn't have access to firearms. So they need to uh, basically follow the existing law and we need to make sure that that's enforced. Yeah, and enforcement's important. A lot of times it doesn't do any good to have a law if nobody's doing anything about it. But let's skip to abortion, which is a hot button issue. I don't want to debate the religious aspects of this. But just basically, now you co-sponsored a bill that would create a national abortion ban after 15 weeks, but you said, with, uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong on this, with some exceptions. Well, give me an example of an exception. Well, let's first of all go back to the reason why I sponsor that. I prefer it be at the state level. That's what the Supreme Court and the Dobbs decision was about. It, for us here in North Carolina, about sending the decision to Raleigh, where it belongs, rather than in Washington, D.C. But if my opponent, Sherry Beasley, is going to sign on and support the most radical legislation in history when it comes to abortion, the so-called Women's Health Protection Act, which is a complete misnomer. So if the Democrats are going to support that, I want to counter it federally. But I really believe that it belongs in North Carolina. Or I believe the decision belongs in the state capitals and not in Washington. Yeah, I'm confused. Though. What, what do you mean? Uh, let's go into that for just a second. The, if, if, you, if you left it to the states, what would have to, I mean, are you saying that every state could have a different standard for what the, the limitations would be and restrictions and they how many could, weeks? They could. Most of those laws are already on the books. It's around 20 weeks here in North Carolina. Um, I haven't seen the state legislature do anything to actually change that. Yeah. But I do prefer that the decision be made closer to home, which for us would be at the state legislature. Let's talk about social media for a couple minutes. Um, TikTok, as you know, is owned by a Chinese company. And one of your colleagues Hi, Dance, correct. Yeah, yeah, in, the, in the Congress, one of your colleagues, I believe he's from South Dakota, recently said he wanted to ban TikTok apps from military bases for security reasons, which sounds pretty good, I guess, logical. And, uh, and then also simultaneously, parents all over the country are concerned about the misinformation, the dangerous things that are said and done on TikTok and other social media platforms. So I guess my question is, broadcasters, television and radio broadcasters, we're tightly regulated. I mean, we're, as you know, I mean, we have to really toe the line on things. Should, should you in the Senate um, try to regulate social media? Well, again, we've got to look at the source for that and, and where the algorithm is being developed. We think that a lot of that is coming out of China. It's owned by ByteDance. And as I understand it, it's less of an entertainment tool in China and more of an education and indoctrination tool there. So how's it being used here in the U.S.? Very concerning. Before it became more known um, as a potential a security threat, we were hearing about that in Congress. I'm on the Financial Services Committee. So it's something that we've been watching for a long time. And are they using TikTok to influence members of Congress? Are they using it to influence our children and our next generation? It's always been a concern. So we, so we have to think about it through the lenses of national security as well. Right, and even beyond national security though, if you get elected to the Senate, would you try to push for 
all of these social media platforms to be regulated in some way so they just don't do whatever they want to do. We have to be very careful there as well and make sure that uh, there's not a national security problem, but at the same time that we protect our First Amendment rights. All right, let's talk about security of another kind, and that's immigration. And, and again, correct me if I get this quote wrong, but I believe you once said, quote, every county in North Carolina is a border county thanks to Joe Biden. What do you mean? That's what law enforcement are telling me in multiple places around the state. So I want to share that quote as coming from someone else and give credit where it's due. And that's law enforcement letting me know what they're facing out there. For instance, in Iredell County, just a few counties away from here, next county where, over from where I live in Davie County, uh, in one law enforcement traffic stop, they found enough fentanyl to kill 250,000 people in one stop. That's 72 hours away from coming from the border. When I was at the border, and you've seen the access roads, and sometimes there's a wall, sometimes there's a single strand barbed wire fence, and that's about it at the border at some places. And what the law enforcement officers told me, the Customs and Border Patrol agents said, yeah, we need a wall, but what we really need is an administration that has our back. And Joe Biden and Sherry Beasley wouldn't uh, have law enforcement's back. So that's, it's a huge challenge right now. Uh, let's talk about stock trades. Now, a lot of people, you know, uh, don't deal in stocks and bonds and things. And so they may say, well, why waste time on TV talking about this? But as we know, one of your colleagues got into some amount of trouble or alleged trouble with this, and others have too in Congress. Here's the question. Would you support some kind of a ban that congressmen, senators, and Supreme Court justices can't own or trade stocks while in office? I think it calls for a level of transparency. Uh, I think members and, and your viewers should probably look up the Stock Act, S-T-O-C-K, which is Stop Trading on Congressional Knowledge. That's the acronym for the bill. And I think what it does, it just tries to prevent or tries to prevent trading on insider knowledge because we have lots of discussions. I'm on the Financial Services Committee. I don't own a single individual stock. So, um, again, not a personal concern. But I think uh, I don't think there needs to be a ban, but I think there needs to be transparency. And one is you want to increase the trust of Congress. And right now, it's probably at an all-time low. Yeah, but, but Ted, the, the, going back to your enforcement thing, it just seems like a lot of people slip through the cracks, even if they get around a loophole in the Stock Act. So it's still kind of a concern, isn't it? Yeah, well, the Ethics Committee has done a good job of, of highlighting it when there's a problem, if there's been a delay in reporting. And there is, a, a for somebody trading an individual stock other than a mutual fund or an ETF, it, it has to be reported. I believe the you can look under the Stock Act, but I think it's around... 24 or 48 hours. Right. Uh, let's talk about federal judges who get appointed. Now, I don't want to pick on the one that Trump appointed. I don't want to get into Donald Trump or anything like that. But when the Mar-a-Lago classified documents thing started, there was a judge who he appointed who stepped in early on to try to, you know, sort of in his favor in a way. I guess the question generically is, regardless of political party, should judges who are federally appointed recuse themselves anytime they come up in a case where it involves somebody that maybe had a hand in appointing them, somebody on the Judiciary Committee or a president or whatever. What do you think about that? I think you have to take that on a case-by-case -case basis and make sure that they're able to rule within a constitutional framework. So that's the main concern. Let's talk about the Ukraine very briefly. We pumped about $54 billion into that. Is there an end game on this? Do the taxpayers keep funding this? What we really need is Western Europe to step up and do their part. I mean, America has done a tremendous amount, including investments, um, but we don't need our boots on the ground over there. Um, we need our material, we need our supplies, and number one thing is to stop the atrocities over there. What Russia has done is absolutely unfathomable. But bottom line, Jim, this should have never happened. Had Joe Biden been strong in Afghanistan, which unfortunately his moves led to losing, us losing 13 Marines, it's heartbreaking what he's done. But that also gave license to Putin. It gave license to uh, China to rattle a sword rattle in the South China Sea. It gave uh, uh, North Korea permission, essentially, to test intermediate range missiles again. And it gave Iran missiles to be, or uh, it gave them a sense that they could be aggressive um, again as well. So it's tragic. Very scary times. We have about a minute left. Let's wrap up by saying that, uh, talk about being a third term congressman. Pretty popular in the 13th district. You could ostensibly stayed in for a long time. Why did you want to run for Senate? I look at everything that I want to do, uh, making life better for my district and making life better for North Carolina. Um, I come from a family that likes to just do what they say they're going to do and likes to serve others. That's kind of how we're built. And so it's not about the politics of it. It's about being able to serve others. 
All right, well, up on screen, just to remind folks, you can go to www.tedbud.com to learn more about the congressman's positions and why he's running for Senate and what he can do. Ted, I appreciate you doing this. Jim, it's always great to be with you. Good luck. Thank you. We'll be right back after this. Well, that's it for this special voter education edition of Try It Today, but I want to thank some very special folks. First of all, Sherry Beasley and Ted Budd. And I hope you will check out their websites that we put up on screen earlier to learn more about them and their positions. Also, I want to thank Todd Hall and his team at True Lion Federal Credit Union for helping to make this show possible. And thank you, viewers, for taking time to watch. But also, remember to go vote on November 8. Doesn't matter how you vote, but just vote. For all of us here, try it today. I'm Jim Longworth. We'll see you next week.